We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. In 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed, abolishing slavery throughout the United States. Their color was the badge of slavery. Bought and sold, often treated brutally, theirs was a hard life. In 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, which is the largest and oldest civil rights organisation, was founded. In 1954, the US Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court rules in 1954 that pupils cannot be segregated by law on the basis of race. In 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white man, triggering the Montgomery bus boycott. I was arrested on December 1st, 1955, for refusing to stand up on the orders of the bus driver. Shortly uh, uh, thereafter, he, the two po policemen came on the bus, and one asked me if uh, the driver had told me to stand, and I said yes. Anyone wanted to know why I didn't stand. I told him I didn't think I should have to stand up. And then I asked him why did they push us around. And he um, said, and I quote him, I don't know, but the law is the law and you are under arrest. In 1963, thousands participated in the March on Washington for voting rights, equal employment opportunities, and an end to racial segregation. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his oratorical, I Have a Dream speech, to 250,000 people. Even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law, outlawing discrimination based on race. Now, in this summer of 1964, the Civil Rights Bill is the law of the land. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed into law, prohibiting racial discrimination in voting. In 
1966, thousands took part in a march across Memphis, Tennessee, Jackson and Mississippi to highlight racial oppression and violence. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, black power became a rallying cry of the civil rights movement and advocated self-sufficiency for blacks, promoted black collective interests and defended against racial oppression. Are you an American Negro? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What's your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Very good, man. Keep it up. Go sit down. <laughs> The black power movement assumed the quality of person and merely sought the opportunity to express that equality by saying we are a proud people. We don't need you to tell us that. Our kinky hair is glorious, uh, who our black skin is something we're proud of, uh, and we are who we are. In 1972, Shirley Chisholm ran for President of the United States, becoming the first ever black major party candidate. I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, Although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. In 1984, Jesse Jackson, founder of PUSH, ran for President of the United States and gained 21% of the popular vote. Our time has come. A new day has begun. Red, yellow, black and white. We're all precious in God's sight. Our time has come. In 2009, Barack Obama became the first black president in the United States. Rosa Parks challenged her arrest. A little known pastor, new to town and only 26 years old, stood with her, a man named Martin Luther King Jr. So did thousands of Montgomery, Alabama commuters. They began a boycott. Rosa Parks' singular act of disobedience launched a movement. The tired feet of those who walked the dusty roads of Montgomery helped a nation see that to which it had once been blind. It is because of these men and women that I stand here today. It is because of them that our children grow up in a land more free and more fair, a land truer to its founding creed. There was victory and there was struggle. Hundreds of years of oppression and prejudice make it hard for true freedom. Deep-seated racial issues have been around the entire time and still reverberate today. What started as a joke a hundred years ago when a group of men donned bedsheets for a romp has over the years attracted to it persons charged with acts of harassment, intimidation, and violence throughout the South. Even though the nation has been outraged for many years, the Ku Klux Klan persists with its bizarre ritual and trappings. But a hundred years is a long time for a joke. When such an order as this moves in and takes over the police power, you are completely at their mercy. 
and their atrocities and their violence can be visited on anybody that disagrees with them in any given situation. The Ku Klux Klan is a secret organization which for 100 years has been allowed to exist in this country. Virtually every president of the United States in the past century has said the Klan has little regard for constituted authority. I will not force my people to integrate against their will. This morning, the mob again gathered in front of the Central High School of Little Rock, obviously for the purpose of again preventing the carrying out of the court's order relating to the admission of Negro children to that school. In the next decade, in cities and towns, villages and hamlets across America, other discriminatory barriers, other prejudices are struck down, some voluntarily, some not. Much is achieved, but much still remains to be done. We are oppressed. We are exploited. We are downtrodden. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. So the only way we're going to get some of this oppression and exploitation away from us or aside from us is come together against a common enemy. <laughs> Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate, you should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? When a criminal starts misusing me, I am going to use whatever necessary to get that criminal off my back. And the injustice that has been inflicted upon Negroes in this country by Uncle Sam is criminal. Don't blame a cracker in Georgia for your injustices. The government is responsible for the injustices. The government can bring these injustices to heart. Uh, there is nothing sadder to people struggling against oppression in Ireland to look towards Boston City and see our people. We know how they got here. We know the oppression they fled from Ireland in various generations to get to this city, being used to oppress the black people of this city. People tell me I don't understand the situation. They tell me blacks are lazy, they don't want to work, they want to lower the standard of education. In fact, they tell me all the things I was brought up to hear about myself, things Protestant people said about Catholic people in Belfast. And uh, I think that's part of it too. I mean, if they really understood what was happening in Ireland, they would get themselves sorted out and stand on the right side here because we identify very closely in our struggle for equality and our struggle against oppression. In fact, the whole inspiration of our civil rights movement 10 years ago came from the black movement of America. And it looks to us from where we stand at home that our people are being oppressed with the active assistance of our people. We find that very sad. As a week of pretrial motions ended today in the case of the four Los Angeles policemen already indicted in the Rodney King beating, the county grand jury signal that will be the extent of the criminal case. The TV viewers across America and around the world stunned by its brutality. One of the worst riots in American history. Can we, can we all get along? The United States of America is in the middle of another racial struggle. Hate crimes and race-based police violence show that the world needs to engage in honest dialogue about racism. White people need to have conversations with other white people. Educate yourself. We cannot expect black people to teach us about an unjust system they did not create. It is not a problem we need to empathise with. It is an issue we have to fix. It is a start to open your eyes and to learn about inequality and oppressive systems. It is not the responsibility of black people to prove to white people that racism exists. It is the very system we benefit from. Don't be sorry. As white people we are born into that privilege privilege to learn about and not have to live through racism and systemic inequalities. Racism isn't just hate and violence, it's systemic disparities, 
inequality in accessing healthcare, education, jobs. It is being apathetic to a humanitarian crisis. It is silence when black people are being killed by the police and systemic racism. You don't need to tell anyone that you aren't racist. You need to show that you're anti-racism. It's an uncomfortable discussion to have, but it isn't up to black people to end racism. That's down to white people, like me. We need to amplify black voices, listen, and take the time to learn. I want you to imagine yourself as a teenager, and you wanted to go to the store to get a drink and some candy, and on your way back home, someone started to follow you. You have no idea who this person is, or even why they're following you. So like any teenager, you start to try and get back to your house as fast as you can. You have your hood up so this person can't see your face because you have no clue who the fuck this person is. But you never make it back home. Because that person following you saw you as a threat. Even though he called the non-emergency 911 number and was told not to follow you, he did anyway. There was a scuffle. You heard a gunshot, but how could that be? I didn't do anything wrong. I just wanted to go home to see my family, to see my dad. I want to see my mom. I can only imagine those were the last thoughts that went through Trayvon Martin's mind as he was lying on the ground and George Zimmerman stood over him with a gun in his hand. People in the neighborhood started to report hearing screams from Trayvon and gunshots. 911, do you need police, fire, medical? Um, maybe both, I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. Okay, and is it a male or female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why. I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. Just send someone quick. Okay. Does he look hurt? I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So They're sending. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right, what is your phone <laughs> number? There's gunshots. You just heard gunshots? Yes. Trayvon had only gone to the local store for soda and some candy, and now he was dead. Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager, was shot down by a white neighborhood watchman who claimed self-defense. Zimmerman never denied shooting Trayvon, but claimed it wasn't self-defense. In the circuit court of the 18th Judicial Circuit in and for Seminole County, Florida, state of Florida versus George Zimmerman, verdict, we, the jury, find George Zimmerman not guilty. Even though he was told specifically not to follow Trayvon and that police were on their way, one cannot even begin to imagine the devastation that Trayvon's parents felt when the not guilty verdict was read in the courtroom and how they had to fight to get Trayvon's case even heard. I just thought we were going to get some kind of justice. Hundreds taking to the streets, carrying signs, calling for justice for Trayvon. This is a 17-year-old kid who was murdered by a vigilante who followed him, profiled him, and shot him dead, and it can't go on. Trayvon was only a teenager. He went to high school, he had friends and family who loved him. Trayvon had no criminal record. He took ski trips and had gone to New York. He took English honors classes, and his favorite class was said to be math. Trayvon was no different than any other black teenage boy living in America. Trayvon was no different than me. I am, I am Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. No justice. Trayvon Martin had the same right to be where he was yes. as Emmett Till yes. to go to a public yes. store to buy some bubble gum. Yes. Trayvon Martin had a right to be where he was That's as right. same as... Rosa Park had to sit on that bus and not get up and move to the back. Yeah. Trayvon Martin had the same right that Megger Evers had to pull up in his driveway to go home and greet his kids. Come on, yeah. The system failed Trayvon, starting with the laws of Florida along with the court system. But what did come out of the death of Trayvon Martin was the formation of the Black Lives Matter group, which focused on the better treatment for all African Americans in American society. The movement has since spread across the world. Black Lives Matter! It came to uh, fruition um, after Trayvon's death, and that was uh, attributed to African Americans just being um, tired of, of 
being on the short end of the stick. Our kids are our future. So, so we have to have some type of hope and we can't just give up and say, okay, well, that's the way this country is and we're just gonna leave it um, just like it is. You know, we gotta do the best that we can to try to make positive change. When we say Black Lives Matter, we know that all lives matter, but all lives aren't uh, in danger as black lives are. We get killed for lesser reasons because maybe the police thought you had a gun, maybe because you were walking away from the police, and we get shot and killed. You see the man being shot. You have to look at those things because if you continue to pretend like this situation isn't happening, then you are part of the problem. There is a clear disparity when it comes to race and police brutality. Statistics have shown that around one in a thousand black men and boys in the United States alone are expected to die at the hands of police. That makes them 2.5 times more likely than white men and boys in the United States to die at the hands of police. Black children are taught that if they even come in contact with the police to not resist and not provoke. They are taught that this will save their lives, but sadly, as time has shown again and again, this is not the case. This ain't about just Michael Brown no more. It's bigger than that. This for all the this for the injustice that's been done to all the black black males that's been that's been killed by police. In the shorthand of news, Davis is simply the black teen shot and killed by a white man, allegedly over loud music. Within seconds, Officer Daniel Pantaleo had wrapped his arms around Garner's neck. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Garner's cries of I can't breathe 11 times are among the last words he spoke before his death. And the evidence here does not support charging police officer Daniel Pantaleo or any other officer with a federal criminal civil rights violation. This is an outrage, an insult to injury. You killed my son, and you won't get away with it. I'm at the uh, Beaver Creek Walmart. There is a uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. Is he got it pulled out? Yeah, he's like pointing at people. Police shot Crawford, claiming he refused to drop what turned out to be a pellet gun. Declined to indict two white Cleveland police officers, Timothy Lohman and Frank Garmbach, in the shooting death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice. Rice was shot in November of last year after being spotted waving a gun in a park. It turned out to be a toy. This is a 12-year-old kid, life, that was taken. And they letting everybody know that it's okay for the police officers to do whatever they want to do. The system continues to fail black people, and they will continue to fail you all. Like I said, because this happened with Orlando, when they get done with us, they coming from you, for you, for you and all your interracial children. Y'all are next. Hands up, don't shoot, shoot. And if you're like me, growing up black, you have had the talk with your parents. And by the talk, I don't mean the sex talk. I don't mean the talk about puberty, but the talk about police. I think everyone can relate when we've been given this talk by our parents. And we're told when you come in contact with police, you know, keep your hands where they can see them. Don't talk back. Don't resist, even if you didn't do anything wrong. Always be polite. And it's sad and disparaging that our parents have to sit us down at a young age and explain to us how to act in front of the police because no matter what we do, our lives can be at risk. This is America, and this is fucked up. Her life mattered, and we showed that. He was just waiting on something to happen. And unfortunately, my daughter came to his door, and he shot her. Black women are not exempt from police brutality. Far too often, when it comes to discussions about police brutality, Black women are isolated. Black women have long suffered mistreatment, abuse, and violence at the hands of police, but these injustices are underreported or unheard by the communities. Black women are not immune from black blindness and are not immune from being viewed as a threat simply because of the color of their skin. In the eyes of the law, black women are equally as devalued and demonized as black men. In fact, 
black women are victims of violence at a higher rate than all other groups of women. Yet when it comes to the debate about police brutality, they are often left out. In November of 2006, 92-year-old Katherine Johnson was shot dead in her own home by undercover police officers who later planted drugs in her home as an attempted cover-up. Elderly woman killed in a botched police raid. This is what we know. Katherine Johnson, 92 years old when she was killed. Police went to her home based on falsified paperwork claiming there were drugs inside. It should never happen again. It should not have happened then. In March of 2012, unarmed Rakia Boyd was shot dead by Officer Dante Servin. We want to also talk about Rakia Boyd today, 22 years old, when she was shot and killed in 2012 by an <clears throat> off-duty Chicago police detective. Dante Servin fired several shots over his shoulder into a group of people Rakia was standing with near his home, striking her in the back of her head. Between December of 2013 and June of 2014, Officer Daniel Holtzclaw sexually assaulted numerous black women while on duty. Prosecutors said Holtzclaw targeted 13 African-American women in the poorest parts of Oklahoma City over a six-month period. In some cases, he specifically sought out women who had outstanding arrest warrants. All 13 women testified. He did things to me that I didn't think a police officer would do. In February of 2014, Yvette Smith was shot dead by Officer Daniel Willis after calling 911 in regards to an altercation. When she opened the door to the responding officers, she was shot twice. I answered the door, and it was two um, investigators, two of them. They told me your mom's been involved in an accident, and I'm thinking it was a car wreck. You know, and it was like, no, she was shot by an officer and she died. You got a mother of two gone. The woman beat cancer, just got out of knee surgery, and was fighting diabetes, dude. My mom's 5'5", 135. Mm -hmm. If you find that aggressive, you need to turn your badge in. Yvette reportedly opened the door and was shot. So where you're going to have to go back and look at who's hiring and who's training these people, mm -hmm. and how were they training them, and what, what protocols are you supposed to follow, and what didn't you follow? In July 2014, video captured Officer Daniel Andrew repeatedly punching Marlene Pinnock in the head as she was on the ground. Graphic incident in Los Angeles is under investigation tonight after video emerged of a police officer beating a woman on the side of a highway. Oh my God. The video was recorded along the Santa Monica freeway last Tuesday during the afternoon rush oh hour. Oh in it, 51-year-old grandmother Marlene Pinnock is seen being pulled to the ground and pummeled by an unidentified California highway patrolman. In November of 2014, Tanisha Anderson, who suffered from mental health issues, was killed by police after slamming her down on her back and stomach. She died in front of her family. In July of 2015, Sandra Bland was violently arrested and died in police custody. Get out of the car! And then you I will light me? you up! Get out! Wow! Now! Wow! Get out of the car! Real failure to signal! You're doing all of this for Get over to... there! I'm still just at a loss for words, honestly, about this whole process. How to switch lanes with no signal turn into all of this. Sandra Bland arrested after that routine traffic stop earlier this month, then found dead in her jail cell three days later. In October of 2019, a Tatiana Coquise Jefferson was shot dead through her window by Officer Aaron Dean after her neighbor reported that her front door was open. Wolf, tonight the Fort Worth police are profusely apologizing to the family of Atatiana Jefferson, saying basically they don't know why this officer did what he did. The police are promising a full investigation tonight, which the victim's family basically has no trust in. On police body cam video, an officer is seen approaching a door of Jefferson's home in Fort Worth. The screen door is closed, the solid door is open, and the lights are on inside. The officer walks the perimeter of the house. Then, as he approaches a window... Put your hands up! Show me your hands! Jump. The officer had fired within only a couple of seconds after shouting his verbal command, and never did he identify himself as police. A Tatiana Jefferson, 28 years old, died on the spot 
in her bedroom early Saturday morning. Tonight, her devastated family is demanding justice and accountability. This man murdered someone. He should be arrested. These examples only reflect a short few of a long list of race-based violence and injustice against black women. In 1966, three years after making the famous I Have a Dream speech, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this in an interview. How many summers like this one do you imagine that we can expect? Well, I would say this, we don't have long. The mood of the Negro community now is one of urgency, one of saying that we aren't going to wait, that we've got to have our freedom. We've waited too long. So that uh, I would say that every summer, we are going to have this kind of vigorous protest. My hope is that it will be nonviolent. I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. I would hope that we can avoid riots, but that we will be as militant and as determined next summer and through the winter uh, as we have been this summer. And I think the answer about how long it will take will depend on the federal government, on the city halls of our various cities, and on white America to a large extent. This is where we are at this point, and I think white America will determine how long it will be and which way we go in the future. It has been over 50 years. Another summer of injustice and unrest. On May 25, 2020, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a 46-year-old man named George Floyd went to a local grocery store called Cup Foods to buy cigarettes. The cashier behind the register suspected that the $20 bill George was using to purchase the cigarettes with was fake, so he proceeded to call the police. When the first pair of officers, Thomas Lane and J. Alexander Kuang, arrived to the scene, they drew their guns on George while he sat in his car with two other adults. Lane proceeded to handcuff George and inform him that he was under arrest. A few minutes later, officers Derek Chauvin and Tao Fao began to assist in George's arrest, with Chauvin taking over as lead officer. Unfortunately, things quickly took a tragic turn from here. Security footage from the store captured Kuang struggling to put George in the back of the police car while Fao looked on. A minute later, Chauvin is seen pulling Floyd out of the squad car and he falls onto the pavement while he is still handcuffed. As George is laying on the ground, Chauvin proceeds to put his knee on George's neck. Chauvin did not move his knee from that position for eight minutes and 46 seconds. At no point did Derek Chauvin move his knee from George Floyd, even when he begged him to, even when George Floyd said he could not breathe, or when he called out for his mother. Derek Chauvin did not remove his knee when George Floyd lost consciousness or when witnesses begged him to check for George's pulse. Chauvin did not remove his knee from George Floyd's neck until he was dead. Cell phone video from one of the eyewitnesses at the scene shows Kuang holding George down by his torso while Lane was holding down his legs. Thao stood by to block potential interference from onlookers, but he essentially didn't do anything to help George during the arrest. All four officers have been arrested and charged in George Floyd's death, and they have also been fired from MPD. Derek Chauvin was initially charged with third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter, but his charges have since been amended to second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. His bail has been set at $1.25 million, and as of this recording, he is still in police custody. Chauvin could face up to 40 years in prison if he is found guilty. Thao, Lane, and Kuang were also charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. The first charge carries up to 40 years in prison, while the other carries up to 10. Each of their bail amounts were set to $750,000. They are all also still in police custody. 
How is it that Derek Chauvin was able to remain on MPD for 19 years with 18 complaints on his record? Or Thao, who has six complaints on his record and was sued in 2017 for excessive force when he beat a man so bad he broke his teeth. Lane had only been on MPD for four days prior to George's death, and Kawang was a rookie following Chauvin's shitty instructions. None of these men should have ever been given the opportunity to protect and serve anyone. One bit of information that threw everyone for a loop was the possibility that George Floyd and Derek Chauvin may have already known each other. Both men used to work security for a club called El Nuevo Rodeo on Tuesday nights. The former owner, Maya Santamaria, claims she isn't sure if the two ever crossed paths since George worked inside the club and Chauvin sat outside in his squad car while he was off duty. Chauvin had been working part-time at the club for 17 years, but George had started working there in 2019. Santa Maria admitted to several media outlets that she had witnessed Chauvin being aggressive with black customers and that he had pepper sprayed crowds and even called up other squad cars for backup. She explicitly described his actions as being quote unquote overkill. Santa Maria says she talked to Chauvin about the way he was treating her black clientele, but the fact that she never fired him is questionable. In terms of POC solidarity, this is a perfect example of why it gets heavily criticized. You cannot confidently call yourself an ally and stand by while an injustice is being done. Santa Maria was complicit in Chauvin's actions against her black customers because she continued to employ him, especially during events that were marketed towards African Americans. When other people of color see a white person being racist towards a black person, and they excuse it or don't say anything at all, they're proving that their solidarity is performative. They're proving that their allyship simply does not exist. Santa Maria felt it necessary to still have Chauvin at her club, even though he showed her on several occasions that he posed a threat to the safety of her black customers. George Floyd's unnecessary and senseless death at the hands of police has sparked a resurgence and global movement that has once again highlighted police brutality and injustice. There have been protests every day since George's death, and they have spread across the globe to show solidarity and to condemn police brutality and racial injustice. Tamika Mallory, an activist for Black Lives Matter, said the following at a rally in Minneapolis. The reason why buildings are burning is because this city, this state, would prefer preserving that white nationalism and that white supremacist mindset over arresting, charging, and helping to convict four officers who killed the black man. That is the reality of what we're dealing with. This is not just a few cops doing things across the country. This is not a good cop versus bad cop situation. This is Ahmaud Arbery being shot down by white men on the streets of Georgia, Breonna Taylor being killed in her home. This is in New York City where we were until freedom. We were just in New York fighting the police officers who in the name of social distancing were damn near killing black young people on our streets. This is a coordinated activity happening across this nation. And so we are in a state of emergency. Black people are dying in a state of emergency. We cannot look at this as an isolated incident. The reason why buildings are burning are not just for our brother George Floyd. We're, they're burning down because people here in Minnesota are saying to people in New York, to people in California, to people in Memphis, to people all across this nation, enough is enough. Yes. And we are not responsible for the mental illness that has been inflicted upon our people by the American government, institutions, and those people who are in positions of power. I don't give a damn if they burn down Target. 
because Target should be on the streets with us calling for the justice that our yeah. people deserve. Talk about it, Tamika. Where was AutoZone at the time when Philando Castile was shot in a car, which is what they actually represent? Mm. Where were they? So if you are not coming to the people's defense, right. then don't challenge us when young people and other people who are frustrated and instigated by the people you pay, you are paying instigators to be among our people out yeah, there yeah. throwing rocks, breaking windows, and burning down buildings. And so young people are responding to that. They are enraged, and there's an easy way to stop it. Arrest the cops. Charge the cops. Charge all the cops. Not just some of them. Not just here in Minneapolis. Charge them in every city across America where our people are being murdered. Charge them everywhere. That's the bottom line. Charge the cops. Do your job. Do what you say this country is supposed to be about, the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learned violence from you. The violence was what we learned from you. So if you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better. Days after George's death, numerous reports of other recent police killings have gone viral, like the murder of Sean Reed, Breonna Taylor, and Tony McDade. People have also started demanding that older cases be reopened, like the 2014 murder of Tamir Rice, the 2015 death of Sandra Bland, and the 2016 murder of Philando Castile. A public memorial service for George Floyd was held on June 4th, and a private one was held on June 6th. A private funeral is scheduled for June 9th. George Floyd is survived by his five children and his brothers and sisters. Rest in peace, George Floyd. The world witnessed the murder of George Floyd, which left people horrified. For many, George's death has been the turning point in their life that has showed them how unjust society is for black people, a reality black people have been living for decades. The world is so entrenched in racism, it tells us even in death, Black people do not deserve dignity, respect or rights. For black people, every time we see another black person being attacked or murdered due to racism, it's just a reminder that we are not only affected physically or emotionally, but also mentally. On Monday, George Floyd was taken into custody by four Minneapolis police officers accused of trying to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. Okay, Officer Derek Chauvin held him down with a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds while Floyd struggled to breathe. He enjoying that. The whole world is watching to see if African Americans can get equal justice in 2020. You guys aren't checking his pulse and doing compressions if he needs them. Court filings say that for the last two minutes and 53 seconds, Floyd was unresponsive. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. He was being very compliant, and they were being doing what cops normally do these days. You know, just kill black folks. The family has just now released the results of an independent autopsy on George Floyd, showing that Floyd died, quote, as a result of a homicide caused by asphyxia due to neck and back compression that led to a lack of blood flow to the brain. You can't unsee a man taking his last breath and calling out for his mother. You also can't unhear the cries of the families and friends of those we have lost due to police brutality. As black people, not only did we see George, but we saw our fathers, our sons, our brothers, our cousins, and our friends with a knee on their neck. 
We as black people are sad, angry, and most importantly, we are tired. Tired of demanding to be treated equally in society. Tired of demanding our basic human rights. Oh, so I'm out here protesting in DC. They've already gassed, uh, they've already gassed a couple people. Um, it's kind of hard to breathe. The movement can't stop. We don't have time to rest. Racism affects every aspect of our lives. Even when the protest dies down, we will still live the reality of injustice. Black women are five times more likely to die following complications with their pregnancies than their white counterparts. Between 2014 and 2016, the mortality rate for black women was 40 per 100,000 compared to eight per 100,000 for white women. Yes, there are medical causes that help explain some of these deaths, but we can't ignore the socioeconomic reasons. Similarly to coronavirus, the mortality rate for black people are disproportionate compared to white people in the UK. Public Health England released their disparities in the risk and outcomes of COVID-19 only a few days ago. The report states, the relationship between ethnicity and health is complex and likely to be a result of a combination of factors. People of BAME communities are likely to be at increased risk of acquiring the infection. This is because BAME people are more likely to live in urban areas, in overcrowded households, in deprived areas and have jobs that expose them to higher risk. We also see key occupations having a large amount of black frontline workers. In the UK, our criminal justice system shows us black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched and three times more likely to be arrested compared to our white counterparts. These are just a few of the hardships we face. The world profiles black people every day our men and boys are told they are big, suspicious and aggressive. Our women and girls are told we are loud, angry and intimidating. The whole world views us as threatening because of the colour of our skin and it has taken another death for people to wake up to the fight against injustice. So for those of you who have just woken up to the existence of racism and white privilege, who have sworn to never remain silent or complicit in the face of racism again, welcome. Because we as black people have been fighting all our lives. Black lives have always mattered. We have always been important. We have always meant something. We have always succeeded. Regardless. And now is the time. I ain't waiting for. I ain't waiting In 1993, 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence was mercilessly killed in a racially motivated attack in South East London. Five suspects were identified early on, however the CPS determined that there was insufficient evidence to charge them. In 1997, British newspaper the Daily Mail uncharacteristically became a champion of the people when it published an image showing the five suspects in the Lawrence murder, along with the headline. Murderers, the male accuses these men of killing. If we are wrong, let them sue us. Blatant heel dragging and cover ups by the Metropolitan Police meant that it was not until 2012, almost 20 years after the senseless murder of Stephen Lawrence, that two men were convicted of his murder. This meant that three of the five assailants involved in Lawrence's death were never brought to justice. In 2011, in Tottenham, North London, 29-year-old Mark Duggan was shot and killed by a police officer known only as B-53. 
Mark, a black man, was suspected of having bought a firearm and was suggested to have been holding a gun, which he was in the process of throwing away when he was fatally shot. Whilst the gun was found just metres away from where Duggan was gunned down, none of the police officers reported seeing a gun fly through the air. In 2014, an inquest determined that Duggan was not holding a gun when he was shot and killed. Furthermore, Duggan's DNA wasn't present on the gun found in the vicinity of the incident. Despite this, the killing of Mark Duggan was determined as lawful, and no disciplinary action was taken against any of the police officers involved, including the shooter. The tragic killing of Mark Duggan sparked wild-scale rioting across the UK. In 2017, both Rashawn Charles and Edson da Costa died whilst being restrained by officers from the Metropolitan Police. Just one year prior, 18-year-old MZ Mohammed died while being restrained by Merseyside police officers in Liverpool city centre. CCTV footage showed the man being held down forcefully by police, even after he had stopped moving and appeared to have already died. Shockingly, inquests into all three deaths exonerated police officers from any wrongdoing. Just last year, the body of 13-year-old Christopher Capessa was discovered in the River Sinon in South Wales. The boy was found to have been pushed into the river where he drowned to death. South Wales police claimed that there was no public interest in prosecuting the individual responsible, despite them having sufficient evidence to support unlawful manslaughter. The police were accused of institutionalised racism, as many commented that if it were a black boy pushing a white boy into a river, there is no way he wouldn't have been prosecuted. These cases are just a few examples of the many cases of institutionalised racism in the police forces of England and Wales, as well as the Crown Prosecution Service. Until drastic changes are made to the way in which black and minority ethnic people are treated by the police forces nationwide, these injustices will continue to occur. Hi, I'm Adimat from London, England and I was 13 years old when I learned I was black. And no, this isn't a story of the first day I purchased a mirror or looked in one. This is the story of the day that I learned that the reflection I see isn't always what other people see when they look at me. So around, say eight years ago, when YouTube was at its peak, the golden age of YouTube. There was a video that went viral, a video you can still see today, called My Tram Experience. For those of you who haven't watched it, it's the first time the black girl had gone on the tram and she was confronted by a racist white woman who was just spitting out racial slurs. I saw this video and I thought, wow, she's insane. <laughs> and then I read the comments section and it was all a bunch of racist people agreeing with what she said. And I was well aware that there were racist people, but I just thought they existed on a really ugly small corner of the internet. I went into school next day and my first lesson was English. I walked into my English class and everyone was talking about this video as I expected but what I didn't expect was what they were saying. These people that I ate lunch with, I told my secrets to, I hang out with, these people that I interacted with daily were agreeing with the racist woman. These were my friends and I didn't expect them to be on her side. Normally I would confront someone but I think the shock just held me back. That was the day that I learned that there are closeted racists. Racists aren't always in your face. Your friend could be a racist and they could hate you and you'd have no idea. That day, I became paranoid. On the bus home, 
I was constantly worried, thinking, does this person hate me and they're hiding it? Does this person secretly hate me and want me to get out of their country? And it wasn't the source of my anxiety, but it definitely contributed. It never really went away. I just learned to pull it in the background of my mind. Most of you have forgotten about this video. Most of the people who were saying those racial slurs probably don't remember that day, but I do. Hey, it's Battle, and today I want to share something I wrote, because I deserve to be heard, so here we go. Today, I was asked if I'm okay. The answer is no, I'm not okay. I am not okay for many reasons. I don't have a cold, and overall I'm generally healthy. I'm not okay with having to fear for my life as a black man in the land of the free. I often feel I'm not allowed to have a voice in how people who look like me are treated. It's unfortunate that I have to remain silent as black people are being murdered because of the way we look. I hate that I have friends that make remarks like, it's not a race thing, if they would just listen, they would be okay. Or, can you blame them, white people that is, for the way they react because it's black people who act up, and that sucks. I don't feel like I have a voice, because anytime a person of color says anything about the murders that happen, or the injustices that happen, it's like we are to blame. Black people are the only people who get blamed for being murdered. I don't feel like I have to explain to a white person why black people get mad, but I have to. It sucks that I have to literally go through life as just a black man, as a super predator. Because when people see me, they don't see a Navy veteran. They don't see an electrical engineer. They don't see a mentor in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. They don't see the friend, the brother, the cousin, the nephew, the husband, and the son. They see a super predator. I am reduced to just a black man. I shouldn't have to carry around a resume to be respected or to be seen as not a threat. I shouldn't have to feel nervous when grocery shopping while wearing a mask. I shouldn't have to be afraid to shop at places just to be followed around by staff. I shouldn't have to feel like I can't trust my fellow human being. People who look like me should just feel free to live, to just live. The fact is, we don't feel like we matter. I'm not asking anyone to have sympathy and feel sorry for me. I'm asking people to have empathy and feel sorry with me, with us. I want people to stand up and call racism for racism because it doesn't happen and it sucks. I want people to not blend in and be zebras. I have proudly served my country, and I have been let down by the people I've sworn to protect. I feel like my time served was meaningless because I obviously didn't fight for the freedoms of people of color. I fought for people to treat me and people who look like me as scum of the earth. So no, I'm not okay. I am truly heartbroken, knowing that for even minding my own business, I could either have the cops called on me or ultimately killed. Lastly, I have to say that all lives matter when black lives matter. I didn't know what to write. I didn't know who to write to. I didn't know what to write about. So I chose to write a letter to my daughter. A letter that I hope she never has to hear. A letter that I hope she never has to read. A letter that I hope to God she never has to see. My daughter's name is Marley Jordan Jones. Dear Marles. Now it seems like somebody put the green light on anybody with our skin type. So unfortunately, I have to write this letter just in case I don't get a chance to tell you. I was born a son. I was born a grandson, a brother, a nephew, 
but I would not be your dad without my father, my uncles, my grandfather, my brother. Proud black men. And I'm blessed to even have known these men. But to be a part of their bloodline. I was raised by some of the most phenomenal women you'll ever know. And I only hope that you get the chance one day to get to know them because they are your very own family. Your cousins, your aunts, your grandmothers, and of course, your mother. You have royalty in your DNA, Marley. Get to know these kings and queens. I want you to know that there is a world ahead of you. People of our skin complexion, believe it or not, are targeted. Targeted by who? America. Now, if I raised you right, you got a couple questions. Why? I had my hands up. Maybe it was too fast for comfort. Maybe they thought my phone, the one thing that would save me, was the same thing that would kill them. Look into Stephen Clark and how he was shot and killed by a police for the very same thing. Maybe I did what I taught you to do when the police knock on your door, is ask for a warrant. But maybe they just kicked the door down and shot me 76 times like they did Jamari on Robinson. Where? The police have body cams. Theirs were turned off, so it's hard to say. I could have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like home. Like Breonna Taylor or Botham Jean. Or at Walmart. Like Ariane McCree. Even at Taco Bell. Like Willie McCoy. Or even in the back of the squad car, in handcuffs, posing no threat, like William Green. Look into them too, when you get a chance. How? With the hate for other human mankind in his or her heart? Don't know. Bullets don't care who shoot them. But sometimes the police get a little more creative than that. I'll ask Sandra Bland, Eric Garner or at Freddie Gray if I end up in the good place. And when. In my lifetime, they've made it perfectly clear that it's perfectly fine in broad daylight, like George Floyd, to be murdered in the street with their knee in my neck, in front of people telling them that I cannot breathe. One day you're going to get stopped by the police, Marley. When you do, make sure they see your hands and be respectful even when they are not. Your responsibility is to get home safe. And if you're reading this letter, I didn't. Most of our fellow podcasters have never experienced the fear, trauma and pain of racial injustice nor have they lived through the experience that we have. But we all have a platform and we have a duty to speak up and call out injustices. Stereotypes can rule our world and we would like to take this moment to commemorate the lives of black victims. For many within our communities, the senseless deaths of those who we are commemorating the lives of today are a chilling reminder that your life can be in danger simply for existing. This is not just an American problem. This is a global problem and we must stand in solidarity. A time comes when silence is betrayal. Arisa Lilly. Eleanor Bumpers. Amadou Diallo. John Crawford III. Ennis Lebeau. Jamie Krim, Lavon King, Craig J. McInnes, Terence Gilbert, Thorell Jowers, Thomas DeWitt Johnson, Paul Rekemp Jr., Frank Rhodes, Artego Damon Howard, 
Romain Brisbane was 34 years old, driving around with his children in the car. Alicia Glass, Vermond Arki Elmar, Calvin Peters, Brandon Jones, Eugene Williams, Darian Hunt, Michelle Cusseau, Yvette Smith, Dante Parker, Jordan Baker, Ian Sherrod, Mario A. Jordan, Winfield Carlton Fisher III, Lashano J. Gilbert, Akai Gali was 28 years old, walking around his apartment block with his girlfriend. Eric Garner, Willie Harden, Levon Leroy Love, Tyree Woodson, Adante Washington, Samuel Shields, Eugene In Turner III, Treon Tree Johnson, Mackenzie Cochran, Javante Darden, Tiano Meaton, Azel Rodney, Rebecca Lynn Oliver, Andrew Lerone Murphy Sr., Caldrick Donald, Amir Brooks was 17, riding his bike. Eric Ricks, Stephen Isby, Hashim Hanif Ibn Abdul Rashid, Tyshawn Hancock, Travis Faison, Jerry Dwight Brown, Dwayne Carr, Briate McDuffie, Charles Goodridge, Alton Reeves, Glenn C. Lewis, Douglas Cooper, Kashad Ashford, Isaac Holmes, who was 19 years old, just standing with his friend. Tony Robinson, Leonardo Marquette Little, Jonathan Ryan Paul, Theodore Johnson, Ballantine Megbu, Dominic Franklin Jr., Kendall Alexander, Cornelius J. Parker, Dennis Grisby, Quintico Goolsby, Corey Lavert Tanner, Terrence Crutcher, Stephen LaShawn Douglas, Oliver Jared Gregory, Emerson Clayton Jr., Victor White III, Keith Childress, Tommy Yancey, Quentin Bird, Lawrence Campbell, Luther Lathron Walker, Terry Price, Marcus Ryan Golden, Nashalis Vincent, Miguel Benton, Kenneth Christopher Lucas, Patrick Small, Deshaun Pittman was 17 years old, hanging with a group of friends. Nayakomas Garnet, Charles Emmett Logan, Jeffrey Ragland, George V. King, Kiara Crowder, Donovan King, Jamonte Fletcher, Jeremy C. Reed, Jonathan L. Williams, Michael Larey Dozer, Roy Lee Vell Dixon, Von Derrick Myers Jr., Kashawn Witten, Kajim Powell, Desmond Dewayne Luster Sr. was 45 years old and reported a break-in in his house. Leo Blackman Jr., Rodney Hodge, Ronald Singleton, Yvette Henderson, Algero Cross, Ernest Satterwhite Sr., Florence White, Howard Wallace Vo Jr., Jason Harrison, Andre Milton, Jerome Dexter Christmas, Michael Ricardo Minor, 
Adrian Williams, Michael Willis Jr. Charlie Kunang was 43 years old in a tent on Skid Row. Montez Dwayne Hambrick. Veronica Woodward. D'Angelo Woods. David Yearby. Denzel Kernell. Pearly Golden. O'Shane Evans. Antonio Martin. Eric Tyrone Forbes. Anson Joseph. Lieutenant Nolan Anderson was 50 years old and tried to retire. Dominique Sharon Lewis. James Howard Allen. William Mark James. Terry Garnett Jr. Anthony Lamar Brown. Raphael Thomas. Matthew Ajibade. Gregory Lewis Towns Jr. Sean Brown was 28 years old, sitting in a parked car. Afuram Harrison. Daniel Christoph Yilu. Philip Watkins. Ronnie D. McNary. Willie Sams. Robert Storé. Ezel Ford. Donovan Baton. Charles Smith. Michael Reams. Demarius Turner. Devante Kishan Hines. Kendry Omari Alston. John T. Wilson III was 22 years old, walking along the freeway. Paul Smith, Fednal Rhineville, Tracy A. Wade, Bernard Moore, Anison Joseph, Thomas Allen Jr., Brandon Tate Brown, Ladarius Williams, Cornelius Turner, Warren Robinson, Jeremy Lewis, Stanley Lamar Grant, Omar Abrego was 37 years old. He died in police custody. Markel Atkins, Alphonse Edward Perkins, Tanisha Anderson, Antoine Dominique Hunter, Matthew Walker, Cameron Jackson, Christopher Jones, Edward Donnell Bright Sr., Xavier McDonald, Naeem Owens, Henry Jackson, Dondre Burkhard Jr., Rasin Shaw, Jacqueline Nichols, Dwayne Deshaun Ward Jr., Wally Flex was 16 years old and a passenger in a car. Gregory Marcus Gray, Icarus Randolph, Monique Ginny Deckard, Stefan Avery Hart, Hallis Kingsey, Eddie Ray Epperson, Asia Roundtree, Cedric Lamont Bishop, Joe Hoff, Christopher M. Anderson, Betty Jones, Kevin Matthews, Rondre Lamar Hornbeck, Justin Griffin, Devaram Ricardo Wilburn, Cedric Stanley, Lavoy Steed. Dustin Keith Glover, Jerry Brown, Brian DeMarcus West, Leon Haywood, Dontre Hamilton, Emmanuel Wooten, Sinek Josh Pora, Bryant Paula, Dennis Grigsby, Andre Maurice Jones, Rashad McIntosh, Adam Ardeth Madison, Mackenzie Cochran. Jeremy Lake was 19 years old, walking his girlfriend home. Juan May, Charles Leon Johnson II, Myron Deshaun May, Christopher Bernard Doss, Eddie Davis, Robert Baltimore, Aura Rosser, Dante Sawell, Ricky D'Angelo Hinkle, David Andre Scott, 
Mark Anthony Blocker, Cortez Washington, Latondra Ellington, Dennis Hicks, Carlton Wayne Smith, Broderick Johnson, David Latham, Tyrone Davis, Jerry Nolan, Armin Martin, DeAndre Lloyd Starks, Harrison Carter, Brian Pickett, Anthony Bartley, Zale Thompson, David Ellis, Zacharias Jaquan Flint, Arvel Douglas Williams, Christopher Mason McRae, who was only 17 years old, just crossing the street, and Cameron Tillman, who was 14, just hanging out with friends. Ronald Sneed, Matthew Whaler, Eldrin Lauren Smart, Terrence Moxley, Marquise Jones, Laval Hall, James Renee White Jr., Jacory Calhoun, Michael D. Sultan, Alton Sterling, Sandra Bland, Tavares McGill, Eric Harris, Justin Sullivan, Elena Stanley Jones was seven years old, playing in her own home. Brianna Taylor is the latest female victim of a police shooting. She was an EMT in Kentucky. This list is not exhaustive. There are many more black victims and people of color whose deaths do not get the same coverage as white victims. We all come into this world with our first breath. But these next statements are what some innocent black victims said with their last. Oscar Grant, you shot me, you shot me. Philando Castile, I wasn't reaching for it. Freddie Gray, I can't breathe. Samuel Debose, I didn't even do nothing. Kamani Gray, please don't let me die. Kenneth Chamberlain, officers, why do you have your guns out? Walter Scott, they tasing me. Sean Bell, I love you too. Michael Brown Jr. I don't have a gun. Stop shooting. Natasha McKenna, you promised you wouldn't kill me. George Floyd. I can't breathe. I can breathe. And still we rise. Even with being considered victims on the world stage, Black Americans are resilient. We have collectively influenced U.S. culture in every area. We are more than victims. If we want change, first we must get the world's attention. It's safe to say that we have that. Now what's next? After the protests and unrest and when our anger as a community subsides, we must organize. The issue of racial disparity won't disappear because we aren't mad anymore. Our first effort after the protests die down should be to encourage the black community to vote. We need activists to talk to the youth and bring voter registration forms. We hold an amazing amount of power and it's underutilized. Next, we must decide what our individual jurisdictions need. We have to define what change looks like if we plan to make demands from elected officials. When a candidate knows what the constituency wants in clear and concise terms, it is much harder for them to backpedal on campaign promises. If you are unsure how to proceed, form committees. Talk to other members of your community to get ideas. Finally, hold elected officials and the community responsible for their actions or inaction. There are bad apples in every circle. We don't need them disrupting the solidarity we have witnessed over the past few weeks. 
I've seen so many amazing and heroic acts from people of all races, sexes, and ages. We've got to keep this momentum. Allow no one or nothing to set back what we can certainly call progress. This week in Houston, I watched a crowd of 60,000 protesters take to the streets. It was a rainbow of people, a melting pot of demonstrators who are fed up with division. These protests have proven that black people are not alone in this fight. We have allies all around the world, disgusted by the thought of a group of people being criminalized for their race. To all of you, I say thanks. There is an abundance of hope for us yet. Black Lives Matter!